well, that was okay. <laughs> um, that, is, that is one of my favorite uh, songs. Um, it's just, man, I think, I think a lot of people have a lot of issues with faith right now. Faith is one of the most uh, miscategorized, misunderstood words um, that's, that's out there right now. And he, here's the cool thing. There was, there was a famous pastor, his name was Warren Wiersbe. And he said this about faith. He said, faith is not just some kind of religious experience. It's not. We all have faith. I mean, when you drop your kids off at school, well, thank goodness kids went back, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but when you drop your kids off at school, you have faith that they're going to be taken care of. When, when you order a meal at a restaurant, you have faith that the server didn't spit in it, right? I'm assuming. you, I, Right? When you make a deposit, you have faith that the bank is going to take care of your funds, correct? So it's literally not some sort of religious experience. You see, faith is the glue that keeps our lives together. Here's what Warren Wearsby said. It's the object in which we place our faith that makes the difference. You see, if I put my faith in, in, in people... I'm going to get what people give me. If I place my faith in money, then I'm going to get what money can get me. However, if I place my faith in God, I get what God can give me, which is a heck of a lot more than what some person or some bank account could give me. The most miserable times of my life... I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I was absolutely miserable because that's where I put my faith. I'd close a million-dollar deal, wouldn't be enough. Close a $3 million deal, wouldn't be enough. I remember one time we closed a $12 million deal, and the whole time on the plane ride back from the client, I was livid because there was an additional $3 million we didn't get, and that's all I wanted to focus on, and it ruined my whole evening. So, what are you placing your faith in? Today, you know, we're, we're going to talk about a story because this faith is so important. I read a study that 15% of millennials, which is a ton of y'all in here, I'm just a little bit older than the oldest millennial to date myself, 15% of y'all are counting on the lottery as part of your retirement. Wow, talk about some faith. Whoo, that's insane. But there's a flip side of that. Maybe you feel like it's because of, of what you've done in your life has resulted into the mess you're in right now. Maybe you feel like your lack of faith has, has removed God from your presence. Maybe you feel like your lack of faith is, is in some way related to, to your terrible situation. The fact of the matter is that's partly true. And today we're going to look at a story that addresses all of this. Because all of us have something from which we need to be healed. Whether it's a divorce, whether it's past sins, whether it's a diagnosis, whether it's a rebellious child. Whatever it is, we need healing. And so today we're going to talk about a story that deals with a man that was born blind. And it's really the only miracle... In the first-hand accounts of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's the only miracle where the person was afflicted since birth. He was born blind. And our text, our main text, is going to be John chapter 9. So if you want to turn there on your Bible or on your electronic app, um, it's going to be John chapter 9. And we got to remember, and I know we met two weeks ago, but basically what we talked about was literally the verse before this at the end of, of chapter 8, where Jesus told the religious elite that he was God, and they picked up rocks to throw at him to kill him. The very next verse is what we're going to look at. It's still going on at the Feast of Booths, which is this massive feast where tens of thousands of Jews converge. They celebrate the harvest. They're celebrating what <clears throat> excuse me, God has done for them. And so they're having this massive festival, and they have these four huge torches that go up in the air, almost 60 feet. And so Jesus is literally walking amongst this whole environment, and people are watching him. And he had just gotten through 
telling the Pharisees that he was God, and they were livid, tried to stone him to death, and he just disappeared from their midst. Well, how do you do that? I don't know. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. Okay? So we pick up in John 9, verse 1. It says this. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So here's the deal. They had to have known this man. How else would they have known he was blind since birth? He was probably begging at the outer gates of the temple, and is how he made a living. And that living can be kind of luxurious back in those days, so his parents probably had him out there as well for him to beg. Because as the Pharisees and as the religious leader coming in, they're trying to earn favor with God, so they probably would give this guy a few, whatever the currency was at the time. And so he, they, somehow they know him. Now here's a big deal. Back in those days, and I fear even now, it's a very common misconception that suffering equals sin. That suffering equals sin. Or, reverse that, sin equates to suffering. Now, you go out, get drunk, get behind the wheel of a car, yeah, you, you, you may suffer. There may be consequences for your actions. Or, or, or guys, if, you, uh, if you're married and you flirt with another woman, yeah, there, there's going to be consequences, especially today. Um, you still got time. I mean, it's 1130. You're good. It's, we got another 12 hours. If you don't know what it is, I feel sorry for you. But anyway... Um, but there was a huge belief in a thing called transmigration, and it's kind of like reincarnation. So if I lived a terrible life right now, I would die and be born into a lower social class. And so that, that's that term, transmigration. It's a very common belief. And so they, people b- believed, including the Jews, they believed if you were bad in a prior life, you were born with a less life, less attractive life, a worse life, because of your past sin. And so the flip side of that is this thing called the prosperity gospel. So a lot of people think if you pray a lot, you read your Bible a lot, you give a lot to the church, and you do all these things, you're going to have an amazing life. You'll be blessed. Well, to that I answer, you need to find a blessing. Because in my opinion, a blessing is when God shows you himself. Which may come through a cancer diagnosis. It may come through the death death of a loved one. And so anytime I'm talking to someone, casting vision about helping partnering with this church financially, I make sure I tell them that. Because they say some other pastors told them in the past, well, if I give to the church, they say, I'm going to get blessed and I'm going to get rich. I'm like, yeah, the only problem with that is that's not found anywhere in the Bible. Sorry, you may give to this church and give cancer, get cancer right afterwards. Doesn't exactly help on the fundraising, but hey, I'm not really worried about it. I got to be honest. So Jesus quickly shuts this down with his disciples. Very quickly. Look at the very next verse, verse 3. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. So at that point, they're probably thinking, oh, well, who sinned? Listen to what he says. But that the works of God might be displayed in him. He then goes into the necessity of all of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Better get up off our rear ends and get out and start living it out. Because listen to what he says now in verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. So here's the deal. Jesus refuses to associate suffering with sin. Listen, I've got no problem volunteering to y'all. The past six years have been by far the hardest of my, of my life, by far. Struggle with depression, I've struggled with PTSD, I've had a ton of counseling, I've had to walk through just insane things the past six years, and guess what, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's been incredible, because it's drawn me so much closer to God. And I want that so bad for y'all. And I know y'all think that's nuts what I'm talking about. But when I said it's time for followers of Jesus and the church to empty their bank accounts right now, I wasn't kidding I'm serious. It is time. Look what's going on around us. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But here's the thing. It's like he said, the children of the world basically believe in this transmigration nonsense. We believe in transformation. One leads to misery. The other leads to a peaceful and amazing peace 
from Jesus knowing we're forgiven. We are forgiven. We're forgiven. That's what Jesus wants to know. So I got a question for you. Are you associating your current situation with your sin? Again, sin has consequences. But don't associate the consequences with unforgiveness. Again, I don't care what you've come in here with. I don't care. When you truly repent, and again, you're going to hear me say that word it, multiple times every single service. Unfortunately, it is, a, it is a word that pastors do not like to use now because it is not a sexy word. I will use it all the time. Repent. It means your past sin, you turn away from it. You leave it behind you, and you lay it at the foot of the cross, and you die to yourself every single day, and you fall in love with Jesus every single day, and you give it to him. And guess what? The beautiful thing is, it's finished. It's behind you. It is literally washed in the blood of Jesus. I, str I, st I used to struggle so bad with my past sins. And you're like, Nathan, what are they? Well, that's really none of your business. That's between me, my wife, my accountability partners, and God. But here's the thing. I used to struggle with it like crazy. Listen what the writer of Hebrews says. I, I, just, I love this verse. Listen to it. He's quoting Jeremiah from about 600 years prior. And listen to what he says. Then he adds. He's talking about God. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds. How much? No more. No more. No more. God made an intentful choice. He made a choice that when we repent, put our faith in Christ... And die to ourselves every single morning, he chooses to remember our sins no more. He literally says that we don't even receive righteousness when we come to Christ. No, no, we don't even receive it. We become it. We become the righteousness of God. And so Jesus is wanting to make darn sure that he doesn't go another step further until his disciples get that. Because then he finishes, where there is forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. Listen. It's finished. Y'all, please, I know there's people in here struggling with your sins. Maybe you're struggling because you looked at something you shouldn't even have looked at last night. I'm never going to condone that, and I'm not going to say that's right. But the enemy loves to take that and make a big old chain and hang it around you and weight you down where you cannot be of any use to anybody. Repent from it. Turn away from it and start to fall in love with Jesus. And we're going to start to learn how in the world this blind man, how he starts to begin this magical journey to fall in love with Jesus and, and literally make his faith full. And here's the thing. Jesus is saying where there's, there's suffering is there so that God can be displayed. I mean, suffering often equates to the glory of God, either through healing or through perseverance. And here's the thing. I don't claim to have a clue. I don't claim to have a clue why people suffer. I, I, I don't. I don't I, listen, I, I can't tell you, when, when my kids were blowing the doctor's minds, uh, you know, coming, off of, coming out of the ICU with all their open heart surgeries, and man, I could hear the wailing of moms just three or four ICU rooms down because they didn't get to walk out with their kids. I, I don't know why. Listen, I don't know why, but I know God is perfect. I know he is. I don't know why God allows suffering, but I do know one thing. I wouldn't trade what I had to go through with my kids for anything because it drew me so close to the Father. So close. You've got to understand that we cannot try to make sense of God because then we try to be God. So I can't, I can't explain why they're suffering. But then Jesus talks about the urgency. He talks about the urgency of us getting up, getting out of our comfort, and getting out there and building relationships with people that will bear the way to truth so we can introduce them to Jesus. And I'll say it again. That's Democrats and Republicans. That's Proud Boys and Antifa. Everybody's made in the image of God. Some of y'all don't want to get that. Every single person is made in the image of God. And we don't treat them as such. We're wrong before God. So look at what Jesus does in verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground. Yeah. He spit on the ground. I don't know if he did that. That's not in Scripture. I'm sorry. He spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, 
wash it in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, while, while others were ignoring this man and maybe throwing a dollar down or whatever, Jesus starts to spend time with him. Others were trying to legitimize this man's suffering. God, the whole time, was working out a beautiful plan so that we'd be talking about it today, 2,000 years later. And that's what we don't understand. God is always working on a plan, and he doesn't waste anything. He doesn't. He doesn't waste anything. Why did Jesus choose to spit on the ground? I don't know. He's Jesus. He can do whatever he wants to do. Now, I will say this. uh, To heal with spit was only thought of by non-Jews. It was kind of a secular viewpoint that spit could heal eye ailment. I thought about doing an exercise with one of the band members and me spitting. I'm just kidding. But it made the Jews furious. They even had their own law to say you can't heal with spit. So was Jesus doing it to prove a point to the Pharisees that God can use whatever God wants to use to heal someone? I, 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 don't, I don't know. Here's the, here's the crazy thing. What, what Jesus says there, he doesn't say go to the pool of Siloam and be healed. No, no, no. He just says go and wash off in the pool. Doesn't tell him what's going to happen. Jesus oftentimes doesn't tell us what's going to happen. He just tells us to go. He never says anything about coming back. We got to start looking at things that way, y'all. We got to. We got to start having a radical abandonment of our comfort. We've got to. So here's the thing. How's the man respond? Ooh, shoo, that's nasty, man. Why you got to be wiping that stuff over my eyes, man? That's crazy. Why are you doing that? I'm going to wipe all that off. No, no, no. He accepts it. And he enters in a beautiful journey that he takes to build his faith. And so we're going to look at four steps right now that the blind man took to build his faith. Number one, he followed God's command. I cannot stress the importance of this enough. I cannot. There are two choices that we have in this world, only two. Obey God or not. That's it. Our whole lives revolve around that. Am I going to obey God or am I not? And so the guy would have certainly heard Jesus doing this on the ground. His other senses would have been highly more sensitive than the average person due to the fact he had to compensate for the lack of eyesight. Jesus rubs spit on his face and tells him to go to the Pool of Siloam, which is roughly two to four miles from the temple. It's in southeastern Jerusalem. Okay, he tells him to go there, and the crazy thing is Jesus doesn't tell him he's going to be healed. He just tells him to go do it. When Jesus told us to plant this church, he didn't say he'd pay for it. He didn't. He said do it. That's what he said. When he told me boldly, and not in an audible voice, but in my heart reading scripture, praying, I want a church at that old skating rink. I want a church at 1705 Spartanburg Highway, and I, meaning God, will do great things through it. And Nathan, you can choose to obey me or not, because listen, I don't need you. I can get some other knucklehead to do it. I'm just allowing you to have a front row seat and watching me move. That's it. It's incredible what God does. So he doesn't even tell him he's going to be healed. And there's nothing really significant about this pool. I did, I did some research on it. A mighty king named Hezekiah, he built an underwater uh, aqueduct um, that was about 500 yards to get it to a, a certain area inside the Jerusalem wall in about south in southeastern Jerusalem and that's why they named it Siloam because it means sent that's what it means kind of funny isn't it how John writes that out for us and so a step in this man's journey is literally to, to is a question of obedience am I going to do what this guy tells me that I don't even know who he is he didn't even know Jesus yet you see what I'm saying we all have these crazy things that I'm, and this happens a lot, it's happened here, where, where I preach, or, or someone else will come up here and preach, and, and the Holy Spirit moves, and someone comes down here and gets gloriously saved, and then they start entering into all these next moves. Sometimes God doesn't work that way. Sometimes you start working for Jesus before you even know who he is. That's my story. I didn't come to Christ, I was 34, legit. I didn't. Thought I was saved, but I wasn't. A lot of times, the, the, the coming to know Christ is in the journey. And maybe that's a journey some of y'all are in right now. I don't know. Maybe some of y'all are here and you think you're professional Christians. I got news for you, you're not. I got news for you. Someone's always going to know more scripture. By the way, the enemy knows way more scripture than any of us do. Just FYI. He knows it from cover to cover. 
But a lot of times it's in the journey. This man's faith started to grow because he did what Jesus told him to do. What's God calling you to do right now? What's God calling you to do tomorrow morning? Because if you're a follower of Jesus, he's calling you to do something. Now, it may not be to plant a church. It may not be to, you know, to, to do some of the things that, that I've done. That's cool. That's fine. But it's something. It's literally something that God is calling you and your family to do tomorrow if you're his followers. And I guarantee you it does not involve comfort. It does not involve comfort. This guy showed up. He made a space for God. Listen, how do we do that? It's crazy. It leads us to the next step this guy took. And he didn't really take it, but it was a step he had. He was healed. Talk about a faith builder. And here's the thing. He's not the only person to know what it's like to be healed. There are tons of people. I, I, I mean, I've, I've watched my two youngest kids. When I got, Kelly and I got told we were adopting dead kids. There's no way. You're, she's not going to see her seventh birthday. She's eight. She's sassy and thinks she runs the house. And she's probably tearing up the children's ministry right now. I mean, I, I, it's, it's not just that, though. What about your marriage? What about past guilt? What about those type of things? What about unforgiveness? What, what have you been healed from that you don't even realize God's healed you from? And you're not even taking time to realize it. It's one thing Ryan and I are doing. We're starting to literally look at the small blessings, the small prayers that God's answered for us in this church and ourselves and our families I mean, I could tell you some things that you probably, you probably look at me and be like, man, I, he's, man, he's weird. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and I don't have time to go into detail because I'll probably go over it anyway, but I'll go ahead and tell you, us not having church last week, it was a blessing. And I, again, I don't have time to, to reiterate how, but it was. It was a blessing. Will God not have his people to gather in order to bless others? If that's what he wants to do, you better believe it. And I'm just going to leave it at that. But here's the thing. How many of you are hopeless that's, that's been healed by God? It's, it's just insane. You want your faith to grow? Allow yourself to be healed by God, which comes through immersing yourself into the word of God and talking to him and showing up. Take time. Everybody I talk to, busy. Man, I'm busy. I'm busy. Man, I'm busy. I'm busy. Trying to make a buck. Trying to do this. I want this. I want that. I want this. I got to have this. I got to have retirement. My kids are going to college. I'm so busy. I'm busy. Listen, be in a place where you can be still. Be still. And allow the Lord of hosts to be your fortress and show you what he wants you to do. You got to show up. Here's the thing, maybe you all need to fill out a care card right now and either Ryan or myself or someone reach out to you this week. Maybe that's what needs to happen. I don't just sit here and preach the care card because I want to I fill up my schedule. Trust me, I got plenty I need to do. But some of you need to fill out a care card right now and that's the next thing God's calling you to do and you're too prideful or insecure or scared to do it because you need help. And guess what? There's nothing wrong with that. We all do. We're all a mess. Every single one of us. I'm a mess. You're a mess. But maybe that's what God's calling you to do right now. It's fill out a care card and say, Pastor, I need help. My marriage isn't where it wants to be or my kids aren't where they want to be. Or I'm having a situation with work or with these other people. Listen to the people's reaction. They knew this guy. They knew him. Listen to what they say in verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. He kept saying that. Imagine the unbelief amongst these people who knew this guy his whole life. I don't know his name. Let's say his name's Rusty. It's cool. It'd be cool. Man, Rusty's never seen his whole life. He was born blind. His parents had to, had to hold him as a baby, and he was blind. And, you know, everybody's judging him because they thought his parents had sin or he had sin. Man, this is terrible. And that, here he is, a grown man, and I don't know how old he was. Imagine their disbelief. So in, in verse 10, they start to ask him. They said to him, then how are your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, go wash, 
go to the slum and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. This guy's simply telling people what Jesus did for him. How many times have y'all done that? I mean, seriously, that's all he did. The most powerful thing in the world. I know some people in our congregation that I could bring up here and I could put in this chair and they could tell what Jesus has done for their life and it'd be so powerful it's not even funny. Listen, your story is the most powerful weapon you got of what Jesus has done for you. And if Jesus hasn't done anything for you, please fill out that care card and let us talk to you because he's, he's working. So anytime there's a big question in that society, I'm going to move this or I'll trip over it and everybody will laugh at me. Anytime there's a, there's a big question in society, the first thing you do is they go to the religious elite, the Pharisees. It's the first thing everybody does because they were the all-knowing. So they go to them in verse 14 they, or verse 13. They say this. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Uh-oh. So the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. I washed and I see. Simple as that. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. Let me tell you something. There's always going to be division about Jesus. Always. Who is he to you? Because let me tell you something. There are people that hate him. There are people that hate us. There are people that hate me. Because I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Period. The Apostle Paul said, that's all I want to know amongst you is Christ and him crucified. That's it. That's all I want to know amongst them. He causes massive division. It's no different than right here. We already know that Pharisees already hated Jesus. They tried to stone him just a little bit ago because he told them he was God. And here's the problem. The Pharisees were so focused on their tradition and on their rules and on their status that they missed the point a person had met God and gotten healed. Listen, when you meet God, you get healed. And you get healed from something a heck of a lot more important than blindness. You get eternal sight. Man, if we, if honestly, if God pulled back the curtain, if he pulled back the curtain and we saw eternity, well, I don't, I don't even, I can't begin to imagine what, what, we, would, what we were doing. And here's the thing. What, what blows my mind is what we do here on this earth determines how we live in eternity. That's the part that blows my mind. With those of us who say we're Christ followers, Jesus says, I am making a house for you based on how you live down here. Now, that's not legalism. Don't, don't misinterpret me here. I'm not saying the more works you do, the more favor. No, no, no. When you're saved from his word, you can't help but do good works. Does everybody understand that? Because if you don't, raise your hand. I'll stop right now make sure we understand that. When you, when you get saved by the works that God did, you can't help but do works for him, period. And that's what Jesus is talking about. So he healed on the Sabbath, infuriated the Pharisees, healed a man, and it infuriated them. And here's the thing. The Pharisees had jacked up rules. Man, they said you couldn't extinguish a lamp. They said you couldn't walk with sandals that had nails in them because the nails had extra weight. That's some of the rules that the Pharisees came up with. They were jacked. They had all these rules and regulations. They said you could not heal a man unless it was for, to heal him from death. Broke a leg? Sorry, I'll get to you tomorrow. See, I'm serious. As crazy as that sounds. So they automatically were divided about him. Then look what they asked the man in verse 17. Starts to put him on the spot. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said he is a prophet. Now this is, he's starting to get it. He's starting to understand who Jesus did. But he's, again, he's not there yet. He's building his faith. He's taking this journey to faith. And so basically that's the highest category he could muster at that moment was he was a prophet. And it, because knowing the Pharisees were against him could have led to the worst thing they could have done to him, which was excommunication. So keep that in mind. We're going to get to it in just a second. So the Pharisees still don't believe him. So guess what they do? They call his parents in. So look at verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and we know that he was born blind. 
But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. Then John explains to us why they had this. It says, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So here's the deal. When you were excommunicated from the synagogue, it wasn't just a matter of, oh, well, I can't go shoot the bull with the Pharisees anymore. No, no, no. You are socially, economically, you are an outcast. You are done socially. Literally, you are done if they made that decision. So the parents confirmed the miracle, but they refused how. They basically throw their own son under the bus and put all the pressure on him. How many of us have done that? How many of us, when we get asked about Jesus, I don't know. He's cool. He's a good guy. But, you know, hey, church, whatever. How many of us have done that? I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a theologian in Germany during World War II, openly uh, revolted against Hitler and the Nazis. Consequently, got him put in a concentration camp. He got several Jews out before he was hanged. And this is what he says. He says, when Christ bids a man to come and follow him, he bids him to come and die. That's what Jesus did for us. Period. Period. Again, it's my job not to make you feel good. It's my job to tell you what the Bible says and how to live it out to get joy and peace in your life. That's my job so that we all get closer to God. That's my job. So the, Phar the Pharisees were furious now. So what do they do? They call this guy in for another interrogation. So verse 24, so for a second time, they called the man in who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Now that give glory to God means, hey, we think you're lying, so we want you to truly give glory to God, and how about telling the truth now? Back in the Old Testament, there was a, there was a dude named Achan, uh, and Joshua, when Achan had stolen some of, the, some of the sacred things from the temple or from the tabernacle, that, that it started to really hurt the Jewish nation. Joshua called him out and said this exact same thing. Give glory to God and tell the truth. And so they're, they are literally on this guy. Which leads us to the third stage. He was tested. He was tested. Listen, we're all going to get tests as followers of Jesus. All of us are. And I love what his answer is. I love it. Listen to this. In verse 25, he answered, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know is though I was blind, now I see. He still doesn't know who Jesus is, but he's still telling the people, look, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. He told me to go wash his spit off in this pool that was two and a half miles away. I came back seeing. I don't know what else to tell y'all. But he, he's progressing towards Jesus. Do you see this? Faith is a journey, y'all. And so basically just letting the people know what Jesus did for him. So the Pharisees keep pressing him in verse 26. They said to him, what did he do to, to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them. Have I told you already and you would not, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And then he says something that whoo, whoo, would have really made him mad. Do you also want to become his disciples? Wow. These dudes would have been literally off the chain, lit, whatever. They, they would have been beside themselves, ready to lay the absolute smack down on them. And listen how they responded. And they reviled him. Basically means abused saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. They still couldn't get past their status. They idolized the law and tradition. How many times we make mistake doing that? How many churches today are dying because they are making tradition their idol? How many? And again, don't misunderstand me. Tradition is not a good thing or a bad thing. Just don't make it central. Don't. There's only one thing we're going to idolize here, and that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. Nothing else. Everything else is on the table for a possibility for us to do. Period. But it will glorify God, or we won't do it. 
But that's what these, they couldn't understand. They could only think of the Messiah as the second Moses, a zealot, a warrior, who would come in, kill everybody that opposed them, and set up the kingdom. That's the only way they could think Jesus would come, was in the form of a zealot like Moses. They couldn't recognize a Messiah that could reinterpret the law for the good of us. They couldn't. They couldn't get past it. These men revered the scriptures. They prayed all the time. They gave to the church. They fasted. They tithed. Yet they were the prime instrument Satan used to put Jesus on the cross. Be careful. Don't idolize your tradition. Don't idolize your comfort. Don't do it. We're all a heartbeat away from being a Pharisee. Every one of us. Because they're still around today. That's why, listen, as, as shepherd, Ryan, as shepherds of this church, we got a rod and a staff. One's to help gently guide, and the other one's to protect. So, we, and we will use it if we have to. Lovingly and humbly, but if we have no other alternative, we must protect the flock from people like this. And I don't apologize for saying that because Paul prescribes it. So the man who had never had sight, a beggar his whole life, laid the smack down on these religious, prestigious, elite dudes. The man answered in verse 30, Why this is an amazing thing? Do you not know where he comes from and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So this man literally goes into a deductive reasoning that is helping him understand his journey to Jesus. He did a mighty thing. God's not going to let some schmuck or a sinner do a mighty thing. Therefore, he's from God. You see how he did that? He went into what's called a deduction based on the facts. And here's the thing. I'm just going to tell you. I tell people this all the time. Most of the people's problem when it comes to Jesus is they've not met the real Jesus. And if you do a light investigation of secular history along with biblical history, you have to know that Jesus Christ lived roughly over three decades. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died by Roman execution on the cross. And three days later, he was saying to hundreds of people, hey, I'm hungry, let's eat. Look at the scars. you got to deal with that you got to deal with the man that rose from the dead. You've got to. A light investigation of getting yourself edumacated, yeah, that's a word, edumacated will let you know that, that Jesus rose from the dead. And so this guy just merely deduces, the guy's got to be from God. He did a mighty miracle. So they do the only thing they can do at this point. The Pharisees are completely at their wit's end. They know this guy's one, so this is what they do. They answered him. You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. In other words, they excommunicated him. Here's the crazy thing. This dude's more of an outcast now than before when he was blind. As a result of what Jesus did. Listen to me. Just because Jesus heals you doesn't mean your life is going to get easier. It doesn't. It doesn't. It happens to us from time to time so we can suffer for Jesus. I'll never forget, I was teaching at a seminary in Africa. And it was about 2 o'clock, it was like 100 degrees, and for whatever reason, them dudes have a chai tea break at 2 o'clock. And I'm like, man, how, how about a cold Gatorade? No, 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 chai tea. So I'm drinking tea with them, and there was an Asian pastor that was there as well. And so I started talking to him, and he needed a translator. So I didn't realize initially that he had his tongue cut out. And the reason he had his tongue cut out was because he wouldn't renounce Christ back in Asia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then he tells me what an honor and a privilege it was that he could suffer for his Savior and that he hoped I could experience something that amazing. That's what he said. Guys, listen, we, we got to learn that we, wanna, we need to suffer for Jesus. Now, that's not going to involve getting your tongue cut out. I'm not saying that. But my goodness, I, I, I just, if we're following Jesus, we're not going to be comfortable. 
If you want to come to a church and be comfortable, Hendersonville Church is not going to be your church. I don't mean any disrespect. Please don't think I'm being flippant or cavalier saying that. But we have every single intention of throwing Hendersonville Church members to the wolves. I'm just being honest. In the name of Jesus. Now, we're not, again, we're not flippant. We're not cavalier. We count the cost. We did with the, man, I got told I was crazy for doing the virtual school thing because the liability. We counted the cost. I, listen, I called the underwriters, the insurance company. I had a waiver created. Listen, we're not morons here. We, we, covered, we counted the cost and we covered the liability. But listen, it, it was uncomfortable. Man, our place got trashed. And it was awesome. Because kids started to understand who God was. That's the part that was awesome. And it's just crazy. This guy listens to Jesus. He was blind his whole life. And now he's a worse outcast than what he was before he was blind. So listen to what Jesus does. Verse 35 as we bring this to a close. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him. So in other words, Jesus sought this man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Boom. Faith started getting complete. Really, the best way to term that is his faith just got it started. Because it's a never-ending process. Never-ending. It's a never-ending process process. Jesus makes sure he does not leave this man high and dry. It's the same with us. He is never, ever, ever going to leave nor forsake any of us. Never. No matter how crazy our lives may get. This leads to the final step of the blind man's faith. He learned who Jesus was. Son of man, it goes back to Daniel. It basically means the Messiah that comes back. And so he, he acknowledged he was the son of man and worshiped him. Some people struggle with growing their faith because they simply don't even know who Jesus is. And they've been coming to church for years and years and years. And they don't even know who Jesus is. They want to talk about their Savior and how he's awesome, but, but they don't ever speak to him. Who is Jesus to you? You want your faith to grow? Meet Jesus. Meet the true living God that is in this room right now via the Holy Spirit, literally looking at us and looking at our hearts right now. Meet him. Abide in him. Read about what he's like in the scriptures. It's incredible. Jesus, knowing the Pharisees, he ends with this. Knowing the Pharisees are still watching, he says this. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. Now some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus looked at the Pharisees and this is what he says. If you were blind, you would still have no guilt. But now you say we see, your guilt remains. In other words, hey, you think you know it all? Listen, faith is not knowledge. Guys, it's not. I don't care. Listen. We can talk about the Greek words, the Hebrew words. We can talk about all that nonsense. Listen, Satan knows all that better than we do. Who's Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Who is he? Is he someone who has wrecked you? Is he someone who has saved you from your utter sin and you have turned away from it and now you've got a peace? And a burning desire to build relationships with lost people that will bear the way to truth so we can then proclaim Christ to Henderson County, to Western North Carolina, to the Southeast, to the United States, to the ends of the earth. That's our vision. To see an authentic gospel movement emerge in Henderson County that extends to the ends of the world. Who's interested in that? Who's interested in it? Guys, listen. If I held up here, if in this bottle was the cure to cancer... Now, I know so many people that struggle with that. But if I had the cure to cancer right here, what, what would it be worth? Listen, we've got the cure to something so much more serious than cancer, it's not even funny. And we just sit on it. We just sit on it. But no one's going to pay attention to us if we don't start building relationships. Let me tell you what building relationships is not. A political post on your social media. That's not building a relationship. It's not. 
thinking Jesus is somehow political. It's not. That's not building relationship. Now, I may agree or disagree with certain people, but that's my personal conviction. You're never going to hear that from this platform. Jesus is saying people who think they know it all don't realize they can't even see. Those who only realize their own weakness can become strong. Listen. Let's look at the steps this blind man took. We can throw it up on the screen. The four stages. He followed God's command. I want to focus there. This is the first step, and it starts with following God's command. What is God calling you to do right now? What's he calling you to do? Is he calling you to fill out a care card that, that you have questions about Jesus? Is, is that what, if, listen, that's cool if you got questions about Jesus. That's okay. You may think he's a moron. That's cool too. I'd love to buy you coffee and talk about it. And let's just talk shop. Let's compare notes. That's fine. What's he calling you though? Maybe he's calling you to get baptized. Maybe he's calling you to get baptized. To show the world what Jesus means to you. By signifying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By saying you're a new creation. Maybe baptism is your next move. I don't know. My gracious, though, we're talking about a God who loved us so much that left the perfect paradise of heaven and came down here and dwelled amongst us for a little over 30 years and bled and cried and sweated and got sick and then watched nails made out of the very alloy he created get driven through his body so that God could pour out all his wrath on him so we don't have to get any of it. And if we really believe that, what are we doing? Listen, I've said this before, and it's, it's, I, I pray about even saying this because it's such a pithy phrase. But I'm sick of playing church. I am. I'm so excited about the message series coming up. I mean, we're already talking about all the way up to Easter and then even after Easter talking about the church. And I mean, I'm just... I just, I feel so focused and so alive and yeah, I'm t tired and I got nonsense going on and got my own stuff going on. Yeah, sure. But man, oh man, I am just, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, God, what, what's the next step for Hendersonville Church? God, what do you have us do? Because he, here's the thing. I, I realize some of what I said may be hard and, and I'll just say, I, I, I don't really I don't, I, I don't really care. If we're going to call ourselves followers of Jesus, listen, this blind man, before Jesus came to him at the second time, was more of an outcast after Jesus healed him. Then Jesus heals him, and he understands who God is. Listen, church, I, listen, if you, if you know anything, if you learn anything through today's message, is to understand that God doesn't waste anything. Take time. Take time and show up for God. Please. And if you got any questions, any questions at all, and please, please come talk to me or Ryan after the service. Because it's just, listen, we're on an amazing journey of our own here at Hendersonville Church. We're praying over next steps, next ministries. It's hard to believe we're a three and a half month old church, but we are, in all honesty. Now, I know there's a lot of you who are at the hotel lobby, who are at the packing house, and that was awesome. But man, we're on a journey. And here's what I can promise you. It's gonna be super hard. It's gonna be super uncomfortable. And it's gonna be the most awesome thing you've ever done in your life. Those are the three promises I can make. But it starts with what has God called you to do right now, tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning. What's he called you to do? And if you, got, you don't know, that's fine. Come talk to me. We'll talk it out. No judge, no judge dude right here. Because I got a lot I can be judged for. Trust me. Be there for God. Because the joy you get is unbelievable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. God, thank you for what your words taught us today. And God, I just, I 
I just, I pray that if there's anyone here who knows they need to make a major decision for God, whether, whether that decision, God, is, is counseling, God, whether that decision is, is to downsize, God, whether that's, wh- whatever it is, whether that's to humble themselves and make a relationship right that's been so messed up, God, give them, give them the humility and God, give them the boldness to do it. Society's a mess. We all know it. We see what's on TV. Everybody hating everybody. God, someone's got to lead. We got to lead out, not with might, not with force, not with pride, not with ego. God, with love and compassion and humility. And God, we've got to be able to build relationships that'll bear the weight of truth. God, it starts right now. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to be tortured and killed and literally become the sin of the world and have all of God's wrath poured out on you, God, so we don't have to take it. We don't. (laughs) It's amazing. If there's anyone here who does not truly have that belief. God, please, 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 please don't let him walk out of this room without at minimum filling out a care card. Please, I'm begging you. And I hear people praying that exact same thing right now, God. Because this may, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We love you. We ask all these things through that name of Jesus. Amen.